Hey everybody, this is Shantan Jetty. Welcome to another painting stream. Another chill stream, as chill as one can be. Uh, I'm here working at my home studio and made some changes to <laughs> to what I'm lovingly referring to as the set. It's just the corner of the room that I sit in. But I've been thinking of doing something with my workspace in this corner, putting up some stuff that uh, is meaningful to me and stuff to have in the background that kind of tells you a little bit about, you know, just it's it's mainly just stuff I love, to be honest. It's, um, uh, you know, it's it's tempting to say, oh, well, this is stuff here to tell you about myself, but I don't, I'm not interested in that, to be honest. Um, it's more stuff that I love, and it just occurred to me that I should have it around me. And so if you look in the background, you can see a poster that was signed to me uh, by Todd McFarlane and an original piece of Amazing Spider-Man art that uh, I received uh, when I was 14 from Todd McFarlane, who was a huge influence on me. And um, it just dawned on me that, that you know, I there's so many artists and, and works of art that have inspired me and uh, it's kind of almost like for me anyway a little creative temple for me to come and do my work in um, and so it just seemed right to move some of that stuff that's really important to me as an artist into this space you know you can see behind my head if I move it to draw you can see a Rocketeer movie poster um, Dave Stevens was a huge influence to me so yeah it's nice to have that stuff where I can see it because it's been in our home office that we haven't been using for a really long time. And uh, I gotta turn that music down, it's a little too loud for me. There we go, that's a little better. And um, yeah, I'm working on some clouds of smoke and I just realized it's hard to see them. So let me see if I can adjust that. There we go. Whoa, there we go, so it's a little closer. There we go, now you can see where the brush pen is. I'm using a gray Faber-Castell uh, pit brush pen. It's a warm gray, I think it's number 272. And that just allows me to work over some of the silver paint that I'm putting in for this huge um, sort of smoke pyrotechnic uh, effect of Godzilla, or this kind of Godzilla, Shin Godzilla inspired uh, take on the character breathing fire into the space and so if you look you can see how far this piece has come it's come a really long way and uh, yeah really excited to uh, get it scanned and put into the layout for the book I've been doing a lot of work on the book and been watching a lot of YouTube um, watching some of my favorite YouTubers, um, like Michael French, uh, on Retro Blasting, who uh, just wrote me a really kind note encouraging me to keep doing this stuff, which is always nice to hear. Um, and uh, yeah, just watching a lot of artists work and a lot of pop culture stuff. It's really interesting. A lot of reviews. Okay. So what I did and what I've been working on uh, on this piece has been trying to put in this kind of um, billowing fire and smoke clouds into this painting. So that's been what I've been dedicating my time to. It fills out the composition a lot more and strengthens it overall uh, as a painting. There we go. Honestly, I can't believe and I'm looking at it how far it's come along, because I was really struggling with this lower corner, um, lower the, there we go, lower this a little bit. There's this little value move that I've been trying to do where the feet of Shin Godzilla overlap onto the silver smoke, and so that's been one of the things I've been working on, and you can sort of see, make sure I get it in frame 
can sort of see where I'm doing that right down there where that overlap occurs usually I'll say if you're drawing not to, to pull your brush towards you I usually try to sweep out but because this is being filmed it's one of the things that um, is a compromise I have to make for you guys to see it and for to have it uh, be something you can understand is to um, work in a manner to where I don't turn the paper as much as I would if I was working on this. So I'm going to take this warm brush pen and put it away and then now grab my regular paintbrush with gouache on it and put that nice dark in. What I love about this paint, what I love about opaque watercolors and gouache is that it's just this really beautiful rich dark and it's matte so it doesn't reflect when you move your head around. When you use certain kinds of pens and even some of the best India ink it's not going to lay flat and be matte, it's going to have a little bit of a sheen to it and I prefer it to be a nice flat tone when it's put down. And these are all things that just come from experimenting with media. It's, it's strange because I had some really good direction from certain artists and illustrators I would meet or who would do interviews, but um, this is definitely not something I learned when I was in college. Uh, this The kind of stuff that I do and I'm working out right now just came from me being in a giant um, art supply store at my college and <laughs> just grabbing by happenstance uh, these paints that I still use today and I've taken breaks from using them it's not like <laughs> it just intentionally stuck with them but um, yeah I mean it's I can't overstate uh, by the time I got off to uh, college the teaching of uh, at the college I went to to the uh, teaching of skill was well out the door um, it was uh, <laughs> a lot more you know esoteric in fact to be honest I think I had some teachers who didn't even uh, draw or paint um, and uh, that was that was definitely interesting for someone who was as skill interested as I was um, because you know that's what you make your money on there we go and so you know a lot of what I do when I'm teaching whether it's college or even doing these demos online is is based on the things that um, I needed and the things that are actually useful when you get out of school. So a little less, <laughs> a little less, almost uh, no theory and a lot of practical knowledge. Because I honestly think that that's the thing that is responsible for so much of the great work I mean, it's easy to project, you know, ideological intent into great works of art, and you can see people. Um, I think it was J.R. Tolkien who was talking about the tendency in the '60s for uh, for fans of Lord of the Rings to see, um, and you can actually see him talk about this in an interview, BBC authors in their own words, to talk about the One Ring as a um, allegory for the nuclear bomb and what was so interesting about it was is he rightly says there's a big difference between an allegory which Lord of the Rings is not by his mind and I think we'll go with him because he's the creator of it and an application which is to say you can take this story and apply it to whatever you like but that doesn't mean that's what the intent was <laughs> you know and and honestly um, that gone mental that whole idea of application as being truth, like any random person grabbing something, applying it to something and thinking that's what they intended is actually at the heart of, um, you know, certain, um, you know, self-obsessed uh, academic uh, theories like uh, reader response theory and things like that, which uh, seek to uh, give the audience some kind of responsibility in dictating what a work is. And... Um, if you want to have a work be about something, uh, I always think it's a good idea to make your own art. It never hurts. <laughs> As opposed to trying to tell someone what their artwork means. And, um, and you know, it's coming from somebody like Tolkien, somebody who 
spent a lot of time studying other people's work, doing his own translation of Beowulf and all that kind of thing. And um, I would say that I've definitely been thinking a lot about the making of art versus art criticism, the um, idea of didactic and um, intellectual intent behind work versus the physical vitality and expressive nature of someone who's a highly competent drafts person or um, somebody who is um, has spent the time and put in the due diligence of study. I don't know that we always, um, I think a line has been blurred between creators and critics and um, craftspeople and connoisseurs. And that's something that was um, one of the most unknown art history books that uh, is probably the best art history book. If I was to release the book, you know, if there was to be a re-release of the book and I could be involved in it, I'd market it as the art history book nobody wants you to know, <laughs> nobody wants you to read. And it's uh, a book called The Unchanging Arts, um, and the author's name is Gowans. And he goes into... Actually, I wonder if I have the book kicking around here. I'm trying to remember, actually, if, um, if I got that right. But the name of the book is The Unchanging Arts. It came out in the 70s, and it was a, a book that really broke down and sort of laid bare all of the ridiculous kind of assertions of um, postmodernism and modernism. And it's one of those books that it doesn't shock me at all that it's not in print because it's just a book about where all the great stuff came from and it, and it doesn't point to um, the kind of biographical approach or political approach, which has become so in vogue, um, and more to the... Um, idea of instead of fine art and commercial art it talks about the idea of um high arts low arts and um high art low art and then the decadent arts which is a really interesting um framing and what it essentially says is that high arts are um basically a craft carried to the point of it being an art form so it's not that it's trying to say something important. It's that it has a type, a level of skill that sort of transcends what the average person is capable of. And uh, what I believe Gowans would, you know, put under the uh, category of the decadent arts are the arts that are all about just, you know, the individual expression and um, appealing to, you know, what uh, he referred to as the connoisseur class. And that it's um, it's puzz it's filled with this kind of quest to figure out what is the definition of art, and I think he talks about that question of what is art. Is I think he says something to the effect of never in the history of the world has there been a question that's been asked that has been um, so unimportant, or I think the word I forget exactly how he put it, but it's something that I was I was introduced to the book by a buddy of mine a couple of years ago and it just it was an incredible um it was an incredible experience to uh see you know that someone had <laughs> that this these things that i've been uh struggling with for a number of years as i've been teaching college for probably about 16 years now and i've watched students come through and i've watched different generations at this point i would say i've seen about three distinct generations or three distinct uh, different groups of students come through delineated by time. So I had my students that were from, that I taught from 2003 to about 2007 or 8, and then I had my students that I taught from uh, 2008 to, I want to say 2000 and maybe 12 or 13, and then my students I've taught from 2014 to 2020. And I think we're in the middle of a change um, right now, but it's been really interesting because when you have that much time, you really get to see what things work and what ideas are not helpful, what classes are strong, and what classes um, are, what's the word I'm looking for? And I don't mean the sense of, of their art ability, I mean classes that mesh 
and where everyone benefits from being in that group environment. And um, Gowans kind of takes a really good look at it, which is when I've got young artists and people are asking me about making art or they're talking to me about the stress associated with art, a lot of times, and lately I think my, my personal feeling about that is, is that they're probably going about it wrong. It's not... It's like doing any kind of athletic pursuit. Your anxiety doesn't really serve a purpose. And I think when people are making artwork and they're actually in the active process of studying, like if you're looking at an anatomical structure, a building, or something that you're trying to put together, and it's, it's not working, that's a different kind of stress than what, do I, what should I be drawing or painting. You should be studying everything and trying to improve. And after years and years of doing this, when people ask me, who are the students who are the most successful after school? I think it's the, the ones who are the best students in the sense that they get their assignments done, but also the ones who are the most skilled, the ones who really dedicate themselves to the craft. And I don't um, believe in that, that um, thing that your ability to draw or paint well is something you're born with. Some people are born with it, but it's utterly training. And so when people tell you Hmm. As I often experienced uh, people saying that, um, you know, that, that it's, it's a natural innate ability that you can't learn. I found that um, when I was in school, it was because they themselves didn't possess it or know how to teach it. And I think that that's one of the biggest things that um, can lead to people being depressed as artists is, is if you have enough people around you who don't know how to teach you and tell you that it can't be taught it feels pretty hopeless and you're just much more susceptible to some kind of ideological belief system about art. And I think that's where a lot of the um, kind of art as biography or art as an ideological or political construct come from, from people who just don't know how to teach anybody how to paint or draw and from people who don't know how to paint and draw themselves. I mean, what else are you going to do? You want to be an artist, but you don't know how to make art. It's pretty tragic. Um, and I, I <laughs> and it, you know, Sorry to get off on a rant. It's been a pretty strange day today. Um, but no better than Saul Bass, one of the most important graphic designers and artists of the last century, um, said, you know, that if he could give art school students any bit of advice or even design students any bit of advice, what would he say? And he said, learn to draw. And um, I think Saul Bass, you know, kind of knew what he was talking about. He designed the AT&T logo, which is still in use today. So not exactly a, uh, a dim bulb. And uh, he also did the opening title sequence for Alfred Hitchcock's films, including Psycho, Vertigo, North by Northwest. And um, it's interesting. You, you know, when I see the artists of previous generations, the, it, the level of skill is amazing to me in terms of what I'm seeing them do. And one of the, the, the things I guess I've been doing lately is I've taken a break from uh, streaming movies or looking at new stuff, and I'm doing a lot more purchasing of Blu-rays and DVDs and looking at some of the masters because I just, and frankly, old books and old comics and old illustrators, because I just am not getting what I need right now from a lot of the current stuff. And when I do my work, I'm not comparing it to a lot of the work that's being I mean there's some amazing artwork being done today uh, artists like uh, Nick Alm uh, it's Nick and then ALM um, and I'm just trying to think of some of the people I follow but there's a lot of amazing artists and some people's names I can't pronounce unfortunately for you but um, there's a lot of amazing work happening but I also think when it comes to illustration, when it comes to artwork that's designed to entertain, I'm not, I'm not seeing as much as I want to see, which is why I pick up my brush and make the stuff I do. And I hope the people who buy this book are entertained by what I do and entertained when they, they get it in the mail. That's why you know I put so much time into it. But I have to be honest, um, I like to see as much work as I can that just... Whoa. <laughs> Sorry about that, folks. Um, I like to see as much work... Oh, there it was. It was caught. The cable was caught. Sorry about that. 
Um, I like to see as much work as I can that just demolishes me. You know, that's just mind-bendingly good. And so it's easier for me to go and look at the classics and look at the Criterion Collection um, on the advice of, again, God, I, I gotta not turn this into a retro-blasting show, but on the advice of Michael French, I got a, I got a hold of, good lord, sorry folks, the camera work is so shoddy today, um, but on the advice of Michael French, I got a hold of uh, a version, a fan-edited version of Star Wars without any of the special edition effects. And, and I personally don't have a problem with those effects. And I think I have even less of a problem after watching this version. But I also have tremendous respect for the original version that I saw when I was a kid. And the thing it got me thinking about was how George Lucas, when he was making the original Star Wars movie, was just, you know, reaching for the moon. And it's the same thing I think about old comics. It's the same thing I think about Dave Stevens' work or Todd McFarlane's artwork or Guillermo del Toro's artwork. You look at their early stuff and the sheer creativity and the sheer motivation in it, you just kind of realize how with all the technology that we have and with all of the artists that we can look to, we're able to stand on the shoulders of giants. And you, I just sort of want more. And I want to make sure I'm giving people more when I do my work. Um, and I guess that has been the big thing that's been on my mind. I think I am increasingly... Wrong brush. I need my This brush has a terrible point on it, so I need to get the other one. Um, I'm increasingly impressed by things that are coming from outside of mainstream industry and it's not because I'm anti mainstream it's when mainstream entertainment with all of its considerable resources is doing it well there's no way we can compete and right now I think is the best time for anybody to do the kinds of things that a lot of us are doing which is launching an Indiegogo there's a link to my Indiegogo in the description for the art book that this work is gonna be in is to come out with something that's great, that is fan-backed, and I couldn't be more grateful to the fans that made that book fund that uh, this is going to be in. And every, I just had another purchase the other day, which I was really thrilled about. But for me, I think there's never been a better time to do work because I just think there's a huge underserved audience out there. And I'm certainly not the person who came up with this. But looking at some of the custom action figures and custom toys and things like that that Michael reviews and some of the stuff that I myself like, like um, the uh, Wesley Snipes uh, Blade uh, custom head and some of the stuff that 112 Collectibles uh, are doing. I mean, there's just great stuff out there. And with 3D printers and software like Blender, there's no I mean, it's a free open source software, 3D modeling software. There's no end to the things you can do if you're willing to put in the time and put in, you know, the effort to it. All we need is the will, the work ethic, and to stick our chins out and say, all right, I'm going to try to make something. And when I made book one, I had no idea if it was going to fund or how it was going to go. And I don't know what my, the Indiegogo project I'm going to do after this is going to be. For right now, this is my, my total focus. But I will say that... I definitely am drawing a lot of strength by getting out of the kind of current mentality and the current mindset and looking at the masters and some of the most brilliant artists that we've ever produced. And uh, I would encourage anybody, frankly, to, if you have the means, um, start investing in Blu-rays and build a library of work, and a library of work that you pick because it inspires you and if you don't know where to start start looking up lists of movies that are in the library of congress movies by masters and master filmmakers and it will serve you so well and don't watch them this is the weirdest thing advice i could give don't watch them like a student don't watch them like a there was a guy <laughs> there was a guy i knew in college 
who one time when I was in the quad of the college that I went to and I don't think that I was flirting with people but you know flirting with with <laughs> girls in my class I would think I was just talking to them and I was being funny or doing whatever and it was very off the cuff like it wasn't I mean just being funny having a sense of humor and this guy after <laughs> we were there I think he was an upperclassman and he was uh, flirting with freshman girls and I was a freshman and I was just hanging out just being a freshman I had a girlfriend at the time I think who went to another college and um, I probably should remember that but um, but the thing about it was is after we were talking to these girls they were just laughing at, at a lot of stuff I was saying they walked away and I'll never forget this kid said to me he was like um, he was like hey hey I gotta say I was really impressed with what you did there and I'm like what he goes you know how you did this joke and it was structured this way and then you brought it around over here and then you know how you wrapped it up in the end and da da da, da that was like really uh, really impressive and I just looked at him and I was like what are you talking about <laughs> just being funny my god I practically wanted to check his pulse and see if he was alive you know, not everything you do is calculated for effect, for heaven's sake. Sometimes you're just in it, and you're present. I don't have another artist in my head. I don't have, uh, ooh, how are you going to receive this, other than it's going to be the best thing, and I hope you like it when you buy the book and when you're looking at my artwork. But it is not like I'm doing an audio commentary as I paint and breaking down. You, I can't think fast enough for this to all be... Uh, you know, pre-planned. And, and I think it was just a terrible prison to be in, uh, to, to not have a uh, spontaneous thought or to not, you know, to be playing a game or doing a painting and not be present for it and just be somewhere else, be watching it from the outside, disassociated. And life is too short, way too short to live it that way, you know? And it's weird because artists can inspire me in ways that I'm sure are not anything to do with their art that are unintentional. Like when I see video footage of uh, George Lucas since he sold Star Wars, you know, pushing, you know, his daughter Everest around in a stroller. That just, it's really interesting to me to see that the creator of this film series is a human being. You know, I mean, which I've always thought, but it's just, it's a reminder of what's important. You can be a billionaire, and if it's your dream to get married, which he got married uh, very recently, I mean, not that recently, probably about 10 years ago, and if you want to be a father again, um, and he has two, or two, three uh, grown adopted children, that, uh, it's hard to argue that that's not a better use of your time. You know, and uh, it was just Father's Day recently, and I spent a lot of time with my kids, and there's nothing I'm ever going to paint to be certain that's as important as my kids. They're my priority. I mean, I could make artwork, but my, my kids can actually... <laughs> I can make artwork, but my artwork can't make artwork. My children can make artwork. My children can laugh, my children can breathe, my children can run around. I don't understand. Um, and the same thing goes with um, my friends and the people that I care about. And I just, I don't think any artist worth their salt can lose sight of that. If your politics get way more important to you than people, if your theories and your ideology get way more important to you than human beings, uh, I don't know. I don't know if you can make art. And I don't know if you can do paintings or any other creative pursuit if you spend the entire time while you're doing it thinking about, um, gosh, I don't know, thinking about something else, something other than the brush, the gouache, the you, uh, paying attention to the paper, which is to say, I don't mean thinking about yourself, but you thinking about you know, all of this kind of muscle memory that you have in your head. It's, it's symphonic when I'm putting in these, uh, when I'm putting in these brush strokes, there's something really symphonic about it to me. And there's something like, it's like, uh, I'm riffing off of these things because I spent so much time studying. I get to play now. And so when happenstance happens and it works, 
um, I can sort of spot that and not correct it. And my freeform painting works more often than it doesn't now. And that's the whole purpose of study. And it's a shame because I see a lot of people who try to create that illusion. It's a common thing when you're a young artist. And let me not say a lot of people. Let me just keep it on myself because I don't like the idea of, you know, <laughs> inventing straw men. I, I can find enough faults in myself um, to go after because that's what I'm in the business of. I don't need anybody else to do it for me. Um, but the thing for me is when I was starting out, I tried to make happenstance happen by looking at artists like Todd McFarlane, uh, who I was inspired by, and try to copy their happenstances. I didn't realize it was something they probably weren't even thinking about that I was zeroing in on and trying to analyze. And in that way, maybe I was a lot like that kid I was talking about in college. He was trying to understand my sense of humor and what was just me being silly and having a knack for making people laugh, you know, again, a sense of humor, an awareness of humor, and trying to systematize it. And it just came from being funny and and probably seeing, a, you know, a lot of uh, comics. I watched a lot of stand-up comedy when I was a kid. I think it was VH1 stand-up comedy hour or something uh, that I was watching uh, up-and-coming comics on. And uh, it's, it's to me, it's you've got to study, but it's a dreadful habit of um, trying to figure people out like they're a mathematical equation or a robot. And I think that um, not everything needs to be analyzed, or at least not everything needs to be uh, analyzed to the point to where it's a autopsy. I'm all for audio commentaries. In fact, I love them. But I'm not interested in cinematic autopsy or cinematic uh, uh, ideological framing. I don't believe that all artwork, all relationships, all interactions are political. I think it's all, not all things have to fall into narrow ideological definitions. When a baby laughs, I don't think a baby is saying something or doing something political. If you need to politicize it, you certainly can by will of force um, and through your own, you know, um, confirmation or framing bias. But to me, you're missing the whole point. I mean, I, and I'm probably paraphrasing in some ways things that I've, I know I've heard Guillermo del Toro talk about, who's one of my artistic uh, touchstones. But I can tell you this, when I saw Star Wars for the first time uh, when I was a kid, um, I, I think it took me, I didn't know, I don't know that I had any questions, I just knew I needed to keep seeing it and, and figure out what it was. And I don't mean figure it out in an analytical way. I think the thing that, that, that I was left with from the experience of seeing Star Wars was I was trying to understand why this thing made me feel a certain way. And I wasn't like, it wasn't like a, a high in the sense of how am I going to get that high again, which I think some people try to, to, uh, you know, chase with entertainment. It was more a recognition of a true experience. And I think Joseph Campbell once said, uh, one of my great teachers who uh, did a video series called The Power of Myth back in the 80s, he actually talked about Star Wars and it was recorded at uh, Skywalker Ranch, which I've, I've had the, the privilege a little while ago, um, but in separate, you know, couple of year spans to visit twice. And um, Joseph Campbell said that a lot of people think about that what we're looking for is a meaning to life. And Joseph Campbell said, I don't think that's true. I think what we're looking for is an experience of being alive. And for me, when I'm painting, I have to be skilled enough to be able to let go so that I can have this experience that will translate to you when you buy my work. But if I don't have any skill and I just try to have an experience, then it's just a completely self-absorbed, um, I had an experience so you should have to have one too. And there's this beautiful thing that happens with aesthetics, which, you know, the opposite of an aesthetic experience is an anesthetic experience. So an aesthetic experience wakes you up. An anesthetic experience, like anesthesia, puts you to sleep. 
So when you see something beautiful and elegant in one of my books or one of my paintings, uh, and the link to my second book is in the description, um, it should wake you up. It should it should just really engross you and inspire you and have you go, wow, this is, I'm feeling something. And it's no mistake that if it does that for you, that's, that's great because I was feeling something too when I was doing it. I was present and I was bringing a lot of skill to it. And I would definitely not say that I'm a master artist because I, I feel as though um, I've known some people who I consider to be master artists. Uh, my mentor, Brian Stelfries, is definitely one of them. But um, I'm, I'm definitely not a neophyte. You know, I, I have mastered certain aspects of this process. But I mean, I was just watching uh, whew, uh, Amano do a demonstration um, the incredible uh, concept artist of the Final Fantasy movies. And that guy is a master. Let's see how that's working. I feel like the light is making it hard for you guys to see. Let's see if I can tip my camera down. There we go. That's a little easier to see. Right there. There we go. Sorry about it getting so dark. I got lost in my own nonsense there. Let's see what I got to do here. Oh, man. Long day. Long week. But I can't complain. There are too many people out there, I think, with real jobs. Um... Uh, in terms of uh, medical professionals and people responsible for uh, keeping us uh, safe. And my job is to entertain them after a long day with my artwork. And uh, if someone puts their hard-earned money into one of my books, I want to make sure it's worth it for their time. making artwork my entire life and uh, sometimes it's still kind of I, I don't recall when I, I I just did it as soon as I could I just started drawing now that's not why I still draw everybody starts drawing and everybody makes artwork at a certain point and um, the reason I still draw is because I've never really had a choice and I just need to do it um, and I need it to, and, and I don't mean to say I need to make artwork by itself. It's even, it's more specific than that. I need to improve. I need to study. Um, as I was pursuing artwork, it wasn't because I felt good when I did it. It was because I was trying to understand how it worked. I saw great artists working and really impressive people working in their, their, their craft. And I thought, how do they do that? I want to understand it. And I didn't have that with athletics. I know some people have that with sports. Some people have that with boxing. Some people have that with football or basketball um, or track or whatever it is and dance. But I had it with art. Those were the people I wanted to kind of understand. And I, I really didn't want people to compliment my work. I wanted people to tell me how to improve it. Because I knew it wasn't good. <laughs> so I wanted it to be. I had very high ambitions for my work. Let's see what we got here. Hmm. There we go. Let's see if that's a good color there. I think it is. I think it's all right. I've been doing this for a really long time. And um, not by not by a lot of people's 
uh, standards. I know there's a lot of people who've been doing it, it longer, but um, I will definitely say I had no trouble putting in crazy hours into my work from a very early age. I self-published my first comic book when I was 14 years old, and I self-published my second comic book when I was 16, did my first pro job for an indie comic book publisher when I was 17, and uh, got into one of the, uh, I used to say, premier art schools in the country um, at a very early age. And I met some pretty amazing people um, throughout my life who have been similarly driven. And that's the thing that we most of us have in common is that we're just driven. But I, it, it, to me, it doesn't matter what background anybody comes from. When we're talking about art, it never has. It's it's always about skill. I don't. I think when artists get together who are really good, uh, we really talk about this thing that that you can really only know if you you get the physicality of making artwork on this um, high level. Like it's it's like any other pursuit. Like if if I don't know what it's like for athletes, I um, but I, boxing is the sport that I follow the most. And I imagine it's like a great boxer explaining to a really, really good boxer how to do something. You can't explain that to somebody who is a bad boxer or a mediocre boxer because they don't even have enough skill for you to explain. You know, they have no frame of reference. And so one of the great things about getting good is you get good enough to realize in some ways how bad you are <laughs> or how bad you are, but but you get good enough to where the really amazing and awe-inspiring people can begin to talk to you. One of my favorite moments with my mentor, Brian Stelfreeze, was when he uh, he called me up on the phone because he saw a uh, portrait painting I had done of Woody Strode, an actor from Once Upon a Time in the West. Uh, and uh, he called me up and he said that my paintings had finally gotten to the point where I was ready for the next bit of criticism. And to me, that was like winning an Academy Award. I'm like, I'm finally at the next level of bad. <laughs> to where Brian can now tell me what, uh, what else I can fix. It's the highest compliment you could get from somebody who's really good. And, you know, I uh, when I went off to art school... Um, it was the people at least I went off to school with were there to improve and that's what we were after I think we were a lot less we all had our ideas we all had our stories and we all had our things we wanted to make and I think um, and some of us you know have definitely gone off and done that but we were a lot less about biography and ideology when I was in school and I think that What's interesting is is that um, the more you're into that quest to become better and understand structure and gain knowledge, the more of an impact you end up having in the long run. It's not about what you want your work to do. It's about making your work good enough to deserve the things that it's going to do. And uh, when you put mediocre work out there, it doesn't matter how big of a forum you give it. It can't have any impact. It's a fascinating um, and somewhat obvious reality. That's why we have so few masters. I mean, you can't put any random person into Kurosawa's uh, position and get a cure of Kurosawa. It's not going to happen. It's not how the world works. There we go. That's starting to work. Let's see here. Let's pan up here. Just a little bit. There we go. Lower that down. There we go. For a little wider view of what I'm up to. But I mean, my favorite art form to enjoy 
not to uh, make, to be sure, is film and cinema. I'm a big time movie buff, and and it's more of a cinema buff. I mean, I I love movies in the the traditional sense, but I mean, to me, watching movies is is like a feast. And in one of my drawers over here, I have just a giant collection of Blu-rays. Because more and more, um, I think it's important to preserve hard copies of movies. I like the idea of owning movies and not just having them as digital files. And I don't know if that's just because of when I came up. But um, especially lately, I think it's um, when you see people editing movies and editing works of art... Um, I think it's all the more important to, um, for me anyway, to own them. And the same thing goes with books or manga or comics. I prefer to own hard copies. I just like to, there's something about it, so not having light shined into your eyeballs all day. And that's the thing I love about books. But when it comes to movies, I like to be able to thumb through my collection and, I, and not need a Wi-Fi connection in order to watch movies in my house. And what's interesting to me is I, I can buy a movie 80 different ways. I mean, there's some movies I have two or three copies of. <laughs> it's just because they came out in different versions or different editions. So, I mean, that's what it's like to me. And it's the same thing with I like to see different versions of artwork, different reproductions of artwork that I really love and that I zero in on. But right now, um, Seven Samurai is the movie I'm watching over and over again. That's the one I'm focused on. There we go. And as far as, as you know, creature designs and things like that, I'm inspired by it's definitely um, definitely uh, kaiju movies and horror movies. Although I blame Retro Blasting and Michael French for getting me watching Star Wars again today. Uh, that's a movie and a film series that I just love and is such a huge part of my life. But I just, I, sometimes I just need a break from it because it's um, it's uh, such a huge thing. It's such a, a touchstone for me. You know, it's like there's certain movies that are really important to me that I don't watch very often um, because they're just, um, like I feel like I need to dedicate time to them. And the movie that I think is probably the one I watch the least that's the most important to me, and when I watch it, I like to focus in on it, um, like it deserves better than a casual watch to me, is um, the movie E.T., and I think Star Wars falls under that for me too. Um, Seven Samurai, when I get into a mood of watching Seven Samurai, I'm into it. Um, let's see what else, what other movies. And there's some really great movies that I can watch casually, like the original Godzilla. I can watch that movie, every version of it. I can watch King of the Monsters, and I can watch the original 1954. I can watch Blade a million times um, and sometimes I like to watch really schlocky fun movies I actually had a Van Damme 2 movie <laughs> watch recently I watched the movie Hard Target directed by John Woo um, and I watched um, what's the other one I watched I'm trying to remember that's crazy that I don't remember it um, oh I watched I think I watched Lionheart as well which was a movie a very cheesy movie I liked uh but I was introduced to John Woo and uh, via the Van Damme movie Hard Target, and then that led me to Hard Boiled and uh, John Woo's work as a director. And um, whoops, Let's see if I still have that in focus. There we go. But yeah, I, I love watching movies when I can. But movies like Star Wars and movies like ET are tough for me to watch regularly because again, they're such a they're such a commitment for me because I have so much reverence for those movies. But it's, you know, I, as much as I'm saying that there's a lot of old works, I have seen some modern classics get made. I have seen a few works that I consider to be masterpieces, modern masterpieces that um, should stand the, te stand the test of time. I think the finest narrative work I've seen in a long time, one of the finest I've seen in a long time, 
that I was just studying a scene of earlier today is um, the Netflix uh, miniseries, The Haunting. I think that, funny enough, with Henry Thomas, who played Elliot in E.T., that was a really unexpected surprise. Um, and uh, that movie, as far as I'm concerned, or that, that series, that miniseries, um, is one of the finest works of storytelling and directing in that genre I've ever seen and just a really incredible study of the human condition and I it's one of those things to where I would defend it to the death as um, a masterpiece as a modern masterpiece I think um, people tuned into it that uh, the Halloween time period when it was released and it was like a just topic of conversation did you see that episode and it was really an analysis and an exploration through fantasy means of a dysfunctional family and a really uh, tough um, uh, crisis this family had been through and never recovered from. And the idea of, um, which I think is incredibly relevant today, of wanting to protect your children from life to the point of not letting them live and how you get these kind of dysfunctional adults, these malformed individuals who are um, carry your fear of them growing up uh, with them. And so you get the uh, one character who thinks he knows better and really doesn't know anything. He's still a frightened child. And you've got the characters who, you know, all of them are damaged and wounded in different ways. But it's, it's amazing um, how it, it sort of addressed, I think, and dealt with this idea of keeping your, your children in a bubble until their adulthood. And how when you keep kids from reality, they, uh, it creates um, a world of monsters for them. Um, some imagined, some real, and they're not able to succeed. And um, I can't say enough about that series. It, co it covers so thoughtfully so many subjects and does it well. I can't think of, a, of, a, of many aspects of that show that, you know, it didn't shy away from anything and it did a lot of stuff sensitively and it wasn't grotesque. You didn't hate the characters. You kind of, even the most monstrous acts um, by some of the characters, you kind of see the the toxic justification for it. And um, the character played by, um, blanking on her name, oh, she's a great actor. I'm trying to think of her name. It kills me. Oh, it's gone. Um, but she's an amazing actor, and she plays the um, mom of the family when they're younger. And uh, oh, it's going to come to me. I, I can sort of like see the letters forming, but I can't get it. It's so annoying. Um, but she just does an astounding job. And um, I think it's it should, the decisions that she makes and the paths her fear as a parent uh, lead her down and drive her kids down as a result are something that is very relevant for today. You can't... Um, the horror of parents passing on and adult figures in people's lives passing on and acting on their fear and raising frightened children who don't have any... Um, who don't have any uh, confidence in their own integrity, any faith in the world and faith in human decency... Um, and just think that um, the world is going to crush them and everything is waiting to destroy them. And they see the worst in people because they've been told that the world is filled with monsters. And I think that, that the show does a really good job of explaining and looking at some of the um, results of us giving into our worst instincts and our worst impulses. And um, I think that's... It's so relevant for today because if art's going to do anything, um, it should, in my opinion, one of the most important things, let's rephrase that. One of the most important things I think art can do is to help us to look at the monsters inside of ourselves instead of chasing the monsters inside of other people. 
because that's where um, I think it was in the movie Gandhi. I don't know if it was an exact quote, um, but in the movie Gandhi directed by um, Sir Richard Attenborough, who passed away a couple of years ago, he said, the only uh, devils in this world are those running around our own hearts and that's where they should be fought. And I think that's really true. And I think that um, the haunting sort of deals with the demons that are running around in all of these characters' hearts. And if you are a great artist, you can help an audience to have empathy for them. Uh, and if you can have empathy for these faults in other people, it doesn't make you weak. It actually can make you stronger because then you can forgive those same things in yourself. And I think that that's, for me as an artist, um, that I take my hat off to artists who can, can do that, who can convey that. I think um, judgment and um, disdain and resentment um, in many ways, um, in works of art and in how people live their lives are, uh, the vices of cowards. There we go. Okay, that's coming together there trying to figure out I have a really great reference photo of uh, what's going on in the armpit of <laughs> sorry to to put it that way but it is what it is uh, the armpit of this gorilla and um, trying to marry where the fur comes into which is one color where it comes into the other color which is the blue of the skin and there's something that I like about when I'm looking at blue skin, it kind of reminds me of some of the stuff I was um, exposed to as a kid um, from uh, Hindu uh, art and the blue sort of uh, skin and how aesthetically beautiful I find it um, in as a um, reflection um, in terms of their interpretation of, uh, of portraying... Um, skin of their heroes and I think that's really great um, it's it's it, it, it's an aesthetic that the reason I mean James Cameron I guess used it in Avatar um, so um, clearly and, and people turned out for that movie I understand so um, clearly um, it's it's a powerful aesthetic but to me the um, added complementary color um, uh, efficacy maybe is the word I'm looking for of the orange fur and the blue skin that's being done with um, a real boy I talk about moving from one subject to another but <laughs> being done in uh, Rebor collectibles this British outfit um, are doing a release they're calling Gorilla Z and they've got a lot of variations on it and the one that really just struck me is, is beautiful was this one that has uh this kind of blue green but mainly blue skin it's like a cerulean blue and then this orange blonde kind of fur and I just think it looks extraordinary and it's the kind of thing you can see in the natural world um, but the way that they applied it to a uh, mountain gorilla is really cool I'm sure it's been done in, in you know character design before and, and like I said in nature but they're they're just an outstanding outfit when it comes to aesthetics and uh, hats off to them they got my money uh, it's an exclusive at this toy store uh, called Big Bad Toy Store I actually don't even know where they're out of uh, but uh, Big Bad Toy Store sells a lot of actually my wife just got me something uh, from there for Father's Day which is a Shin Godzilla froze, Frozen version by SH Monster Arts that I have over here that I'm using for reference um, and for inspiration. So, yeah, this is the uh, Shin Godzilla from Big Bad Toy Store. God, I can't move anything in the right direction. And these are all the little creepy 
figures that are emerging from the tail in the final shot of the movie. And uh, I just am a, a huge, huge fan of import toys and domestic toys that uh, have a high level of, um, of creativity and craft to them. And uh, that's, that's interesting to me. Even though I don't... Um, one of the things I love about Retro Blasting is on that channel, uh, Michael and Melinda really do a great job of talking about old toys and nostalgia, which I have a connection to that. But my, the, it's almost like seeing a different uh, part of the elephant. My interest, and I was talking with my wife about this today, is seeing things that are inspired by um, the things I, I liked when I was younger and stuff like that. But um, I like, I kind of do like new versions of things. And, uh, but it doesn't, I only have a few kind of vintage toys that I, I, you know, collectibles for that matter that I, I hang on to. But uh, I, I love uh, what's being done right now with the technology. And uh, I, I love seeing um, fan creations and, and collectibles. Uh, and, and that's the stuff that inspires my art, special effects art. It's, it's interesting. There's not a lot of uh, fine art influence in my work and um, a lot more commercial art and a lot more uh, high art influence in my stuff. Okay, I think that fur in that arm is coming along good. I'm actually pretty happy with that. Add in a little bit more here. Let's lower the camera because I need to move down here. There we go. Whoa. <laughs> Sorry about that, folks. Hope nobody's motion sick. Um, God, I hate where my face is. <laughs> not, not on my head, but you know, whatever. Maybe it, maybe it is. Um, but I want to get more of the painting in frame. There we go. That's better. I should have done that sooner. That's way better. There we go. And so, must be a lot of pollen going on right now. I've got crazy allergies. So again, my name is Sean and Jetty, and this channel is Sean and Jetty Art. Thanks for uh, tuning in. And uh, my book is available. The link is in the description on Indiegogo. It's already funded, and I'm wrapping up. Um, production on the book and I want to give you a look at the process this piece will be in there along with uh, 19 other uh, works in a beautiful square bound soft cover book that I will be signing every copy of and of course there are other perks available like uh, head sketches and things like that um, at the Indiegogo link that's in the description and I appreciate every single person who has uh, picked up a copy of the book. It means a lot to me and my family, and it means a lot to me as an artist. It's been a long road getting here. Um, I, I've never been more proud of anything I've done as an artist as I have been of the first book, and it will be, I'm sure, the same with the second book. Um, it's part two in the series of art books I'm releasing. There's going to be three of them. And um, it's... Uh, it just kind of came out of nowhere. I just felt this sudden inspiration after years and years of working and developing my stuff and uh, could not be happier with where it went and where it's going. There we go. I feel better about that. I think that's starting to work. There we go. But let's take a look. Let's step back a bit here. Get the camera in frame so you guys can see a little bit of my setup right there. And... Here is, there's the tail, goes around to the leg, and then there's the audio, then there's the head of the creature, and it comes over right back to center. I feel like my daughter's dance uh, instructor. <laughs> Bring it right back to center. Except for, I would probably get killed if I tried to uh, do the things that my daughter does. She's a very good dancer. 
and uh, a really I'm fond of her very much and same goes with my son there we go Yeah, when I think about the things I'm grateful for and that I want for my children uh, and that I frankly want for everybody, um, but everybody's got to be in charge of that, their own uh, whatever they want to do. But the thing I think about the most is figuring out what you want to work at and what you want to be dedicated to and not getting lost in a sea of in a laundry list of things that you hate and that you don't like but figuring out what are the things you do like and what are you going to do to make those things happen not doing the wrong thing uh, is not the same as doing the right thing I mean sometimes I guess it maybe could be but um, as an artist one of the worst things I think a young artist can do is decide what kind of artwork and spend most of their education trying to discover what artwork they don't want to make it's almost it's, it's not almost it's definitely better to be just making artwork and studying and improving and looking at life and looking at the world because there are a lot more possibilities in reality than you can imagine in the abstract in your head I've had conversations with people that I didn't know I was going to even have that have resulted in possibilities that never would have occurred to me without that happenstance. And that doesn't mean that happenstance equals um, progress. Sometimes you have conversations and experiences that um, are worthless. And sometimes you have, <laughs> I do believe there are some worthless experiences out there to be had. Um, Maybe we need to learn from them sometimes, but um, I think that if you find yourself having the same conversations over and over and over again with the same people, um, and I'm fortunate enough to have artists and people around me who are interesting and trying to progress and trying to get somewhere um, so that we don't have those co same conversations over and over again, whatever those may be. Uh, I think you're missing out. I think you can't grow as an artist. I The thing I love about fan culture and that I loved about, not I wouldn't say so much now, like when I say fan culture, but I mean what fan culture was when I was coming up. And it's I think it's still, there's pockets of it. Was that disagreement wasn't <laughs> wasn't an issue. In fact, it it was sort of the foundation of why we we talked about the things we did. So, you would go into a conversation with somebody and say, what's your favorite you know, Marvel Comics character? And you didn't all have to agree. <laughs> that, was, that would have been boring. Everybody had their kind of their, their favorite character. And then you'd say, who is your favorite artist? But the joy of it was that you were having the conversation, not that you were agreeing. Not that you were having the same opinion, but that you were having the same conversation. And conversations, the thing about them is, is that when you have really great ones, there's a dynamic quality to them. They don't have a predetermined outcome. And uh, you, you learn from good conversations, you grow from good conversations, and you, you see how you express yourself, and you see um, you're not uh, worried about, you know, failing at it or getting the right grade on a conversation. And, um, yeah, it's some of my best conversations I ever have had in my life. Are just They're private. They're just things you talk about on the phone or, you know, you uh, talk about one-on-one -on -one, and there's a spontaneity to them and I think that there's a spontaneity that seems to occur when people um, talk you know on the phone or talk in person or whatever that or in groups um, online or whatever but I don't mean in, in writing that has a speed to it has a velocity to it and a 
happenstance to it. And I don't mean it's like an aggression aspect to it. Uh, it's got pauses, it's got give and take, it's got inflection that is just so incredibly effective. And the smarter you are and the more experience and knowledge you have, not the more intellectual you are, by the way, but the more experience you have, the richer and better those are. And so when I see somebody and I would describe them as an experienced painter, it's a real simple thing. It's not about how old they are, it's about how many paintings they've done. And you can't get good at conversation when you're just writing at somebody. It's uh, one of those great um, difficulties for people, which is you can't get better at conversation if it's all one-sided. You have to kind of get in a room with people and practice. It's like um, practicing job interviews by yourself. You can't do it because you don't know what someone else might ask you. And uh, it's the same thing with art. Um, when I'm painting, I have that conversation. You know, and that's the thing that makes it interesting to me. Well, it looks like my my uh, <laughs> it looks like my my disk is almost full on my computer because I realize it's saving this stream there as well. So I'm gonna wrap this thing up. I hope that you guys uh, enjoyed the stream. I can't remember really much of what I said, but I think I can remember the gist of it. So get to painting, watch some great artwork. Thanks for backing my book. Again, this is Seanthan Jetty. This is Seanthan Jetty Art. The link to book two is in the description. Uh, if you support it, I'd appreciate it. And uh, I'll make sure I get you something dynamite and autographed. Sound good? Okay. Take care, folks, and have a good evening.